there's a little small voice says, do you want to, you want to see behind the, ma the veil? Do you want to see what you're seeing? And I said, yes, I do. And the whole thing came down. I saw thousands of jeering faces mocking me. And that was it. I'm done. I never touched the drugs again. Welcome to the Weird Christian Podcast. I am your host, Samuel Delgado, and this is episode four. I interview Pastor Doug Riggs. He shares how God took him from a life of drug use to set him on a path to freeing others of their own demons, literally. We talk about his discovery of a modern day Nephilim breeding program, his work with freeing people of multiple personality disorder, and much more. So with no further ado, let's get weird. In preparation, you know, for our interview today, I have a, a ton of questions. Uh, a lot of it uh, circles around DID, uh, for those listening, uh, dissociative identity disorder. Um, but as many interviews as I've listened to, to yours, I've never heard you um, share your testimony. I've seen some of your testimony you have on your website, um, but I want to start there uh, and just you know, hear from you uh, where you came from and how you came to know Christ. Sure, yeah, I'll be glad to do that. I grew up in a home um, where my, neither one of my parents <clears throat> knew the Lord. They were not Christians. So when about 10 or 11, uh, I was with somebody, I don't know who it was, uh, talked to me about the Lord, and I remember praying with him. He was wanting to lead me to the Lord at about 11. And uh, I never saw him again, so maybe I was just lead somebody to the Lord, and that's all there is. Because I know what I, at the time I told the Lord, I said, I, I'll see how this is going to work because there's none of this <clears throat> in my home growing up. So um, that was about 11. I didn't think too much about that encounter. And then I grew up in Boise, Idaho, started getting into drugs and, uh, uh, in the latter part of my high school years, marijuana and mescaline, LSD, and that became really after high school. <clears throat> For me, it was like a spiritual experience, and um, and I was, you know, trying to maybe I get closer to God by through these uh, these uh, <clears throat> hallucinogenic kind of experiences. And then I left uh, Boise and moved to Sumner, Washington. I was continuing on drugs. I was married to a person out of the will of God, and uh, <clears throat> I was working at a store, and I remember just being very miserable. And I remember on one Saturday night, um, I was working the store and I, I said, God, if you're there, if you hear me, I, I really don't want to go on this way. I want it. You can have my life. If you hear me, hear me. You can have my life. Um, I don't want to be in charge of my life anymore at all. <clears throat> so that same night, I went and bought a bike. I still have it down there. It's a secular store. It's white front stores. So I, I, there had been a guy there that had a bit business outside the, the storefront. I think it was insurance, and he had been witnessing to me. So I know that he had been praying for me. Yeah. And I don't remember all he said, but I just remember he was a real bright, shiny guy. I mean, he was just very, very much full of the Lord as I look back on it. But I don't remember anything he said. So I went and bought this Bible, <clears throat> went home that night, and I had a couple of... Uh, the hits or doses of mescaline, pure mescaline. So I so oh, I'll, I'll just take some mescaline and read the Bible. And I think he probably put into my mind, read the Gospel of John, because that's what I did. I went home that night, took mescaline, and read the Gospel of John right straight through. And mescaline, uh, what is that? It's an hallucinogenic drug. It's yeah. not the same as LSD. It's uh, it's more. It's kind of a natural background, but it's uh, it's very subtle. It's uh. But it is a hallucinogenic drug. It's not a narcotic. Yeah. I never was in a narcotics. I mean, some of the the pot and some of the uh, the uh, hashes and things like that, that was more of an opiate. But generally the hallucinogenic. But anyway, I took this mescaline and, and I'm, I'm reading the Gospel of John and I'm telling you, the, the Lord, just like he came right out of the pages. I yeah. mean, he just filled the room. I mean, I knew he was there. And to my mind, this is all connected with mescaline. 
Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm I, I'm up all whole night long, and I mean the Lord Jesus is more real than my physical body, and so I'm calling uh, people that I've met in the past three o'clock in the morning, and people that have talked to me about the Lord years ago and probably given up on me or maybe praying for me. Yeah. And say I I told him I said you know Jesus Christ is real. I mean I he's here. I mean I, I wasn't talking about drugs or anything. <clears throat> so. I didn't sleep the whole night, so the next day I was living in summer, so I went to Point Defiance Park, which is very beautiful there on the peninsula there in Tacoma, Tacoma, and all the trees and everything were just like glistening with life. I mean, I could see everything in the hand of the creator, and, and I'm thinking this is a part of the trip, you know. <clears throat> I said, wow, this mescaline is really something. You really come to know God through these drugs, and right. so I was just uh, really basking in the presence of god so i said well i got one more mescaline uh hit and so i can hardly wait till the next saturday and i can do, go through this again right because in my mind it's a source of mescaline so i took the mescaline the next saturday and nothing happened yeah absolutely nothing happened hmm. and uh and i was smoking marijuana and uh hashish mixed into it very very loaded and you kind of trip on things and it was after that i was still smoking that stuff and i was you know you, whatever you see in your mind that you call tripping there's a little small voice that says do you want to you want to see behind the mat the veil do you want to see what you're saying and i said yes i do and the whole thing came down i saw thousands of jeering faces mocking me and that was it i'm done i never touched the drugs again wow so I looked back, I said, the Lord said it wasn't mescaline because I took it the second night weekend, nothing happened. Right. And I'm done with the drugs because I saw I'm just being mo mocked as being played with. And so that began a journey. I started really getting into the word. <clears throat> I still have my old Bible that I had at the time. And, and uh, from there on, it just uh, continued on with the Lord. That was in 1968, I suppose. What do you think and, it was that was... It was mocking you. Were those real beings, you think? Those are just, they're demonic, the demons, because uh, demons, uh, uh, drugs are a gateway to the demonic realm. And so I had a lot of things I had to clear up afterwards. I had to, I was still very demonized after I came to know the Lord. And so I had to go through a lot of detoxing and have my mind renewed and, and got into a Bible church where they taught the word of God every night from the original Greek and Hebrew uh so i had to get my mind renewed which was a quite a long process so uh it was a long hard journey uh i mean drugs are you know pharmakeia which is are five times used in the greek new testament which is translated sorcery it's it's a gateway you, yeah. people mess with these drugs and you're opening doors to the powers of darkness and i and, you know and i you know i thought these were really wonderful experiences but it's all an illusion it's all based on deception it's all a part of the enemy's um, way to deceive. In fact, Revelation 18, when, it's, when we see the judgment that's on um, the political and economic Babylon there, it says it's through your, that is who you are as this political economic Babylon, through your sorceries, all the nations of the earth were deceived. So it's, 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 it's massive. And no big pharma today is uh, there's a lot of deception. There's a lot of stuff going on right now where people actually believe, you know, this vaccine is going to save us. It's not even a vaccine. It's a biological uh, agent. that's not even been adequately tested. And, uh, you know, anybody that has bad symptoms or dies, it's, you know, it's okay. It's safe. You know, so the governments and the big pharma are, uh, excuse me, the governments and the media are the are the propaganda arm for the big pharma? Yeah. Big pharma, not all pharma, not all pharma, pharmaceuticals are are evil because there are certain things in the mix that we that are helpful, antibiotics, different kinds of things. But there's there's certain things within the big the big pharma that is all about money, all about control. And so I don't want to get off on that right now. But that's yeah. that's kind of the background I got I came out of and. Uh, anyway, I just started pursuing the Lord, went to Bible school, and then um, <clears throat> that was 1971, and now this is, what, uh, 20, 50 years later almost, so um, I started uh, uh, 
teaching a, a church in 1982, Morningside. He began to form an assembly and started teaching the word verse by verse, because that's how I was taught in the church that I was ordained in, and, uh, <clears throat> and began to teach the word of God, and God began to gather people from all over the place, and uh, in the mid-80s, and, and um, I met, there were people that were in the assembly that had a lot of problems. A person came and said, you know, Jesus is in our midst, but it's, I, it's like he's, he's in prison. I don't know what he's talking about. And he was uh, kind of a conservative, charismatic, not weird, but, you know, really had a strong sense of discernment and spiritual gifting. And, I, and he said, I think some of these people got some real, real issues that need to be dealt with. So we started counseling and um, people started coming forward. I couldn't believe all the, in my mind, just teach them the word of God. And, you know, they're, they're, they're going to get better, right. they're gonna get better. They're going to grow, and as they grow in the Lord, then everything is going to work out. I didn't realize that that people could be subjected to very chronic abuse, trauma-based mind control, and in their presenter, their front person, uh, they're there as a Christian, and they are Christians, but they got a whole backside to them that has a hidden occult history, and no matter what they hear of truth, it doesn't set them free. Why? Because the presenter person has been created to be a shield to protect them from their core identity that has been, they were still cult active at the time, still going to rituals on Saturday night and showing up at church on Sunday morning. Oh, wow. hmm. So I'm working with these people in the mid eighties. I didn't know that your, your first church that you pastored. Yeah. It's still the same church. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so um, we started counseling about 1985 and all these different problems. And I'm using, you know, Jay Adams and, uh, friend C. Fred Dickinson, who's a former uh, chair of theology, uh, yeah, theology at uh, Moody Bible Institute for three years, uh, excuse me, 35 years, actually, uh, C. Fred Dickinson. I was using his materials, uh, Dr. Mark Bubeck, uh, the, the adversary, overcoming the adversary. Uh, he was uh, someone that was, uh, at the time, was a very solid counselor, so I was using them as references. So in about 1985, uh, we started working with a core bunch of the people in our church that had all kinds of problems. I mean, no matter what truth they heard, they were still had a lot of bondages. And, and so I'd go through all the various basic biblical uh, counseling protocols, and they still weren't free. It was very frustrating. So um, I was seeking the Lord on this, and then I heard a couple of uh, tapes. It was back then, it was a Salisbury counseling, counseling Center in Maryland. And uh, I heard these people talk about multiple personality disorder, and they had some people giving testimonies of their history as uh, being abused. And I thought, multiple personality disorder? Now, I, Dave Hunt, that's psycho heresy. What do you mean? This is psychology? Where do you get this stuff, you know? And I was listening to it, and I said, Lord, I'm not going there. I don't, where do you find this stuff in the Bible, you know? Right. And so I just kind of left it alone, but I'm working with people that are not being resolved. And I heard about a book that was going to be released that was talking about multiple personality disorder. But because it was written by a preacher's kid, uh, Dr. Jim Friesen, he's a PK and a Christian. He's a PhD psychologist. I thought, well, I'll read it because he's a Christian. I'll right. read what he has to say. So I bought it. I waited for it to come out. It was released in June 1991, Uncovering the Mystery of MPD. So I read the book. And... Uh, Things started to, I said, you know, this guy is, he's talking about things that I'm wondering if this has anything to do with the people I've been counseling with and they're stuck. Right. Uh, I mean, so one of the girls that I've been working with, she'd been in our assembly for 10 years. She's a nurse and stuck. I mean, very, very, she's very demonized in some of the areas of her history. And so I, we'd counsel and I'd meet with her. So I said, so I, took a section of that book and I read it to her about what Jim was saying, what happens to people when they're subjected to chronic abuse and in the splitting and the trauma, they, they create altars, they create parts of themselves. And so I started reading this. I said, I don't know if this has anything to do with you, but I'm going to read this and see if this has any meaning. So I read a section to it. And this woman that we'd known for 10 years, been in our church, she switched into a six-year-old 
kind of tucked her legs up into her chest, put her thumb in her mouth and talked like a little girl said, hi, my name is Sarah and I like ducks and ice cream. Oh, wow. And I'm saying, I said, uh, uh, we've never met before, have we? I said, no, I, no I, she just, she didn't say that. I said, well, who are you? She said, I'm Sarah and I like ducks and ice cream. I said, I don't, I said, as soon as she switched, I said, I don't think we've ever met, have we? who are you? And so she identified herself. And I said, uh, well, what happened? And uh, how come we haven't, I haven't met you before? And she said in a little childlike voice, because we didn't think we would be believed, we. I said, uh, the adult person, Sally, does she know anything about you? No, she doesn't know anything about us. She's not supposed to know. She's not supposed to know. And so after that conversation, I said, uh, Sally, uh, you here? I mean, where are you, Sally? And she comes forward and I said, uh, do you know what just happened? Uh, well, kind of. I said, uh, I just met Sarah. And did you know anything about who you are? Because I said, it's about MPD. And I said, no, she didn't know. So that was the beginning of the journey that took many years for her to be integrated. She was fully programmed by Dr. Yosef Mengele, uh, was part of the bloodlines to bring in false prophet. Uh, this uh, royal bloodlines, her biological mother's Queen Frederica of Greece. If you look at the 1953 Life magazine picture of Queen Frederica of Greece, you looked at Sally, you could see the physiognomy, the phenome is the same. I mean, it's, that's her mother. And uh, so part of the royal bloodlines and uh, the royal family in e England has been very much involved. Prince Philip has a, been a handler for many of these people. He's real old now, he's 99. I don't think he's that functional, but the whole families are involved. Prince Philip, the queen, she's just, just totally, totally involved. Um, the, the sons, uh, Prince Charles, I met a, a biological offspring of Prince Charles when I was in Germany. She's a friend, she grew up in France and uh, she, she was an offspring of Prince Charles. And uh, William and Harry, they had worked with a number of the younger generation that have been in rituals with William and Harry. Multiple testimonies not, not, in, in different localities. So <clears throat> the so-called royals are, that I've met are all pretty much involved with Prince Bernard and, and the royals, you know. So that's just um, part of our journey. And since then, um, uh, we started doing seminars and uh, the first seminar we did was in South Africa, 2012. Uh, seven of us of our assembly went over there and, and we gave a seminar in Pretoria and South Africa uh, in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And then uh, we did three separate seminars in Germany, I think 2013, uh, 2014, 20. 15, I think three consecutive years we did Germany. You're, so you're um, training other pastors? To yeah, the same work pastors, the therapists, because <clears throat> people that <clears throat> I'm working with uh, uh, PA, people who have PhDs in psychology and they're not trained for this at all. Right. So I, 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 I trained, I just work. I worked with someone today who is a PhD uh, uh, psychologist. Uh, Russ Dizdar knows real well. And maybe I, I won't mention her name, but without her permission, but, uh, you know, training uh, counselors and pastors, that's what, we, what, what our purpose was. And so I went back in 2018, did another seminar in South Africa, and then we did our last, last seminar, which I'm not going to do anymore. <clears throat> that's the Lord, excuse me, <clears throat> it gives me direct, a directive to do another one. Our last seminar we did, and it was 10 days in, in uh, Hawaii. And there's a 12 part series we have posted on the SRDID page, which is our seminar, last seminar we did in Hawaii. that kind of unpacks the whole SRDID phenomenon. And, and that was all designed to you know, train people that are wanting to help helpers. And also we worked with survivors there. So maybe I'll, I'll pause there. Okay. Um, so when you said that the, so, so let, me, let me back up a little further. I got uh, some follow-up questions, but um, so this is all happening at uh, the same church that you are at now in Syracuse, is that correct? 
Well, we, we were in uh, Tulsa 29 years before we moved to Syracuse uh, 14 years ago. So at that time, up until 2007, we were uh, located in uh, Tulsa at the time. I got you. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so you established a church in Tulsa and then you moved to, to Syracuse yes. after you already started this work. Right. Gotcha. Um, okay. And so when you say that the, the Royals, Royals are involved in uh -huh. this, uh, what do you mean by involved? Um, you know, you said that there was a handler that uh, essentially programmed um, uh, this this person you were working with. So, um, you know, what exactly is this uh, that you're describing that they're involved in? Well, and during the 90s, when I first started opening up, when I first discovered this, uh, there were 19 people in our church that were MPD multiple. So it was pretty overwhelming. Wow. And there was a core group there that were being handled by Prince Philip. I mean, Prince Philip was the handler. Uh, he was used as a pedophile to condition people sexually to be sex slaves to high, high profile people in government. And so during the 90s, one of my number one nemesis was Prince Philip. And uh, I worked with a number of people who, who uh, were abused by him. And when Mengele was alive, Mengele died in 79, but the Royals, they have a lot of money. Now, in other words, I think it was in the Intelligence Executive Review in 1997, 1998. I don't know if it's still a publication right now, but they estimated Prince, Phil Prince Philip's worth at about nine trillion. So nine trillion is 9,000 billion. So that puts him in a category completely off the scale from Bill Gates or any of these. These people are unknown. They're like the Club of Rome. Uh, he was uh, consorted with Prince Bernard at the very foundation of the first Bilderberg group. He's in the background. You don't hear him. You hear about Prince Bernard. He's, he's there. So it, they have a tremendous amount of wealth. And you don't get that kind of wealth unless you worship Satan. Jesus said, uh, Satan said to Jesus in Luke 4, if you bow down and worship, he took him. And up in a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory in a moment of time. Yeah. And he says, all this I will give to you and their glory if you'll worship me. And so there are those that do worship him and they, they get big benefits. So this, this particular person has been reported through rituals throughout the years. Uh, he's no longer being reported now. Um, since the death of Mengele, there has been a transition to the primary programmers that I'm working with the younger generation. They've all been programmed by hybrids. When I say hybrids, I'm talking about the same kind of phenomenon that we see in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, when the Bani Ha Elohim, which we know from Job 1, 6 and 2, 1 and but 38, 7, 8, refer to angels. Yeah. But the Elohim are not the line of Seth. <clears throat> That's an idea that eisegesis that would came in about the third century AD, all the church fathers and uh, Josephus understood that to be fallen angels. So what happened in Genesis 6 is happening again. Jesus, as it was in the days of Noah, so it return. So will occur again at the, day, the return of the days of the Son of Man. <clears throat> so that has been going on, and um, it, there is a hybrid breeding program, and uh, this didn't originate with me. It, it, the, everyone that I worked with that was programmed with Dr. Mengele, he was a part of that project. I call it the Hitler Genesis 6 project. Um, it's because the goal is to bring in, from Hitler's standpoint, a super race. That is, a race of godmen, the Ubermensch, they would call it. In his mind, it's the ultimate goal of the evolution of mankind. So mankind is evolving. His ideology was derived from uh, the Russian mystic uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, mm -hmm. uh, the founder of the New Age. And then uh, you have uh, Dietrich Eckhart, Eckhart. You have all these, and Nietzsche, all these people were, were formative in the thinking of uh, Hitler. And so he believed in a uh, Aryan fifth root race and that mankind uh, can actually evolve. That's, a, that's also, if you follow the Theophostic Society, it was founded by Helena, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. 
then um, Ani Basant, and then, and then one that su succeeded her was Alice Bailey. <clears throat> and then the Lucius, what used to be Lucifer Trust, she wrote all these, what, 22, 23 volumes on New Age uh, ideology, the externalization of the hierarchy, the manifestation of the Christ. All of this is the idea, ideology of the occult. Hitler embraced this. And the goal of the new age is that there's going to be, we're going to evolve and come into a race of God, men. That's the same thing as Hitler. So this is what is going on. And in behind the scenes, uh, who is the quintessential representation or representative of a God, man, the transhumanist movement, you know, you have Elon Musk, you have uh, yeah. Ray Kurzweil, the whole transhumanist movement. What is the goal to go from, Homo sapien to transcend 2.0 to the to the new man. And uh, so there were machine and AI and all this is we just become one universal consciousness sharing one corporate identity and the great reset at the World Economic Forum. You know, all this is for mankind to, to ascend to a place where we become our own gods, basically. So this is all part of the program. And uh, this is what's going on today. And the people at the top know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. And they actually believe that we're on the threshold as mankind of being able to evolve and be in control of our own evolution and come to that place where we are our own God. Someone asked Ray Kurzweil one time, do you believe in God? You know what he said? Not yet, but we're almost there. We're almost there. Wow. So I'll pause there. Wow, okay. Um, so I want to go back uh, to where this started for you. You said you, you know, you're, you're in this church and, you know, there's, you know, people that are, are stuck in, in, in and you begin counseling and you find out um, that these people have now, do these people know each other that they're being, that, that, you know, that are being programmed you said they're all being programmed by this this same person. Is that correct? Not everyone. I think the majority that are born or multi generational that are born into the project that is they're selected to to bring forth hybrids in this generation. Um, the majority of them that were programmed before the death of Mengele were all programmed by Mengele, and I've worked with people hundreds of Europe and South Africa and America. That have been programmed by Mengele. Wow. Um, uh, he is very skilled at what he did. And he, through trauma based mind control, he knew how to create parts, use death rituals, that is to suffocate a person, and then resuscitate them four minutes later through the window of time, the resuscitation. He knew how to do that. And during that four minute window, uh, he could program different ways in which the life essence separates in death. It's very, it's a very high level sorcery. So all these people bear the same kind of signature or artifacts of the kind of trauma that Mengele was the one used by Satan and employed by Satan uh, to create. He had an agenda, he had a script. He knew where to begin, he knew where to end. In fact, uh, right now, we're just finishing with uh, a couple women in South Africa, one on the, the line of the Antichrist, the Nimrod Apollyon Antichrist side, <clears throat> one on the false prophet who was Michael. They were Mengele's last project and they were twinned and Mengele was into twinning, actually physical twinning, but there's also psychological and spiritual twinning. So uh, perhaps I'll do a, a interview uh, for the first time of what it means to be twinned with Mengele in the project, not necessarily biologically, but psychologically and spiritually, because it's very powerful and it represents a, a level of satanic uh, presence in the body of Christ, because these are all Christians. Yeah. I mean, unbeliever went, went through this trauma, they would die. They couldn't handle it. So it's, if you're a believer, God is the one that keeps you alive through it all. I mean, without him, it would be just too much. People would just, they would just die from overwhelmed from shock. So instead of dying, they just continue to fragment. So Mengele has been the primary um, uh, programmer. 
Um, he lived, he was here in America for uh, off and on and throughout those years. Um, people will deny that and go to the Justice Department to say, oh no, he was never here. So, but anyway, I confronted back in the 90s, I confronted the, uh, the Attorney General at that time. There was a man right under him and I went to him because he, he said that Mingle was never here. I got him on there. His name, he was a, he has, he was a Jewish. I don't know if his name was Green or something, but I got through because I used to be in sales. I know how to get be past the, the front people at the desk. I got him on there and I said, I read your paper saying that Mingle was never here. I said, we have, these are a number of these. I said, I've got witnesses all over the United States I've worked with that say contrary to that. And he said, well, who are these? And I tell him, tell him who they were. He said, he said, how could you believe, how could you believe that they were, that what they're saying is the truth? And I knew he was Jewish. I says, how can we believe the Jews that say that uh, the horrors they went through with Auschwitz and we have Holocaust deniers today, how can we believe these Jews that say it really happened? Right. He, he, he's totally backed down. He said, if I have to rewrite this, I will. And I said, well, I appreciate that because he's been here and we have many witnesses. And these witnesses have gone through a similar hell to what the Jewish people went through at Auschwitz. And he did anything. He had nothing more to say. Um, and he was second to the attorney general. Yeah. So Mengele has been here and uh, he's had a number of homes. He had one in Ohio. He had one right here in Syracuse that people, rich people will buy. He could go put kill, children in cages and do programming. Uh, I've been all over South Africa. I'm working with a number of people in South Africa, a younger group. Mengele has been there. Um, he was very well paid. Uh, my guess is that one session, if you're, and the royals would be the one that would bankroll this. They bank because Mengele doesn't come cheap. So if you're a member of the royal family and you have offspring, if you're going to get power, you're going to have to sell your children over to the project, and then you're going to get tremendous power of Satan. And that child now becomes a part of the project to be abused. And so Mengele would be employed to carry out the programming. And these royals, I mean, you take someone like Prince Philip, if 1997 was assessed at nine trillion. What does it what does it mean to him if it's a hundred thousand dollars a session for Mengele to 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 do to employ his skills to create structured trauma-based mind control in a person? That's nothing to him. So Mengele was flown all over the world. He was protected at some levels by the CIA. And uh, he was here in America, but you know, they knew where he was in South or South America. They knew the 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 FBI FBI files have uh, have released that. We Hitler did not die until 1962. The whole thing of his being killed in the bunker in 1945, that's all a cover-up, just like the Kennedy assassination. It's a cover-up. Levi Oswald didn't shoot him. Everybody knows that that's done any research. So if the Warren Commission can hide and conceal the truth about what happened to Kennedy in, in uh, Dallas in 1963, they, they covered up the Hitler uh, Hitler's escape from Nazi Germany, they covered that up. Why? Because he still had a, an agenda. The rest of his life was to employ Mengele to infiltrate the church and in his mind, destroy the church, which was satanically driven, to infiltrate it, to weaken it so that people are in the church and they're there and they are, they're a weapons platform and uh, they have a front person that represents normal Christianity, but the, Behind them is a layered structured weapons platform to design to bring down pastors, to channel spirits, to release uh, confusion and the dumbing down of people. And so this is not conspiracy theory. This is a fact. And I've been dealing with this for 35, 36 years now. And to me, it's just all, you know, it's just the way it is. But the question is, what has happened to the church that the church is not aware of this? There's a few. But there have been specific rituals throughout the years to dumb down pastors. So they don't even see it. And I'm working with a new pastor in South Africa right now, pastor of a large assembly down there. And he now is embracing this girl that's in her assembly, his SRIDID, and he's willing to learn. And, and I'm, that's the second pastor. I'm also working with another pastor that has a number of multiples in his church solid evangelical pastor and when he watched me do some work 
with some of the people that were, you know, the, the, that, that needed help there. He had no categories for it, but he knew what he saw was real because he's very discerning and he, he knows spiritual warfare. They have four, four, four prayer meetings a week there. Uh, wonderful man of God, but totally oblivious to, to the fact that, that there are people in right there in, 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 in his, the assembly there that are generational SRA trauma-based mind control victims. So when you do find people that are willing to get on board, that's where I'm committed. But the majority, Sam, are either in denial or they're too overwhelmed to even look at it. Yeah, I understand. It's, I understand. Uh, yeah, it's a tough <laughs> subject to to look into. It's very dark. Um, yeah, it is. And you know, it's, it's part of part of what I wanted to ask you. Um, I have more questions I want to follow up on. Um, but you know, where do you get this um, tenacity to continue with this work? Because as you mentioned. So many pastors, um, you know, just, well, they're not willing to look at this. Uh, and if they are, you know, I imagine after years and years of working with this, um, it would be difficult. So speak, speak to working in this ministry and, and how you're able to sustain um, and, and not get just completely overwhelmed and, 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 and bogged down by the the, the darkness of it. Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Uh, back in the 70s, as I was going through studying every Greek word in the book of Ephesians, I have a set here, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, and I went through and looked at every word of theological significance in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. I went through every word yeah. and uh, began to see that, uh, especially Ephesians 4.13, 4, where Jesus, the ascended Christ, gave gifts to men. He gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then in the Greek, pastors, hyphen, teachers. It's not fivefold, fourfold. The Greek is fourfold. So pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints. So the saints can do the work of the ministry until we all arrive at the unity of the faith and the full knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man that is unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When I saw that, we all, plural, as the church, need to attain to the perfect man, the perfect man of Ephesians 2.15, the one new man in Christ. Until, and that's an indefinite temporal clause in the Greek, and I thought, when's this going to happen, Lord? This is 1976. When's this going to happen? What stands in the way for this being realized? And so the Lord heard that. And if he had shown me what stood in the way then, I would have probably backed out because he could only show me incrementally. But because I asked, James says, if you don't have because you don't ask. So I asked him, but he knew he had to attenuate the response because it would have been too much. Yeah. So I spiritually, on a spiritual level, I, I knew that there, had, there was still something of an indefinite temporal clause, the imminency of the Lord's coming from an apostolic framework is not in any moment. It was the generation. All the apostles, the imminency was they believed the Lord was going to come back in their lifetime. But certain things had to take place within their lifetime for the Jesus to return. And each generation has been that way. So the indefinite temporal clauses are until or whenever. So the until means certain things have to happen. Jesus is set down at the right hand of the Father, waiting expectantly until his enemies be made footstool for his feet. That means there's contingency. And we're involved in that process, okay? So I, when I saw the corporate Christ, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, as, they, as Paul says, as the physical body is one body, yet has many members, so also is the church. You think that's what he would have said, don't you? But he says, so also is the Christ. Yeah. The Christ is a singular entity, is a head and body. Yeah. One new man. Yeah. When I saw that, game change. I began to see things that I never saw before in the word of God. 
that there's a corporate goal for the body of Christ. And so I said, what's standing in the way for the church standing, uh, attaining the major stature of fullness of Christ? So I began to study this in 76, 78. And I said, Lord, I'm, I'm seeing this in your word. Why, why isn't anyone else teaching this? Because I'm not going to be talking about this because I really feel alone. Is there's there's got to be another witness. What I'm seeing. And I was reading the, uh, the, the, the Green Letters by Miles J. Stanford, which is on identification truths. And in there, he quotes a lot of the, the old, uh, they used to call them divines, you know, people that, that had a close walk with the Lord. And I noticed kept cropping up as I'm reading, it would stand out like a neon as uh, Miles was talking about different, Miles Stanford talking about different people that really understood our identification with Christ. And so um, he would quote this man by the name of T. Austin Sparks, a man from England. And every time he would quote him, something would just like deep would call into deep. So I called him. He's with the Lord now. But I called him and said, you know, how do we, I mean, who is this guy? And so uh, I found out that there was a distributor of books at that time in America. I went through all the interlibrary loan resources and gathered up all the out-of-print materials of Mr. Sparks that I could find, and I and he understood the corporate Christ, head and body. Christ distinct, but the body and head make up the Christ, and that's in the Pauline epistles. You know, it's very clear. Paul understood yeah. that. So as I began to read his writings, he wrote over a hundred books. I've, I've read all of them more than once. I began to see that even though he's not real clear on Israel and the church, he's, his real focus is that we come to understand the vision that God gave Paul for the church. So as he began to, as I began to read his writings and ministry, I began to be dilated of what the Lord had shown me back in the, when I was going through the Greek New Testament and Ephesians. I began to see this man has tremendous vision from the Lord. From the word, I've never seen anyone like it. So I began to study uh, his writings and began to, to see a dilation, but also the intense warfare that would be involved in this being realized. And so many times I would have been swamped in spiritual death. And I'll go back and I'll read something that he has written, a book. That you can go to austinsparks.net, which is online you can go to the article section or the book section and i would, I would just read read a book uh like for example god's spiritual house chapter three uh the church is for the deliverance and ministry of god's elect they're in captivity and he said the church is in captivity what are we going to do about it so the church is not going to attain the measure of the statue of fullness of christ unless jesus can start clothing himself with our humanity and so that we begin to be jesus with skin on and so like Lazarus, when he was dead in the tomb for four days, um, nobody's going to raise him from the dead. He can't raise himself. He's dead. Nobody's there that can do anything. Jesus says, fourth day, Lazarus, here, outside. And he came forward, bound hand and foot. How does that work? Did he levitate out? Bound hand and foot? He's standing there. He's, he's been renewed to life, which is a picture of resurrection. And what does Jesus say next? Unbind him and let him go. He didn't do it. He's telling representatively, someday those are going to be the body of Christ. Unbind and let go those people who might have raised from the dead, but are wrapped in death clothes. And everyone who is SRIDID is wrapped in multiple layers of death clothes. And so the only way I've gotten through is, of course, go back to the word, be ground in the word, but the singular most uh, spiritual father that I've had in the Lord uh, has been Mr. Sparks. Uh, Major, God has used Major Ian Thomas greatly. You know, the saving life of Christ, the mystery of godliness. Uh, if I perish, I perish. Uh, a number of people uh, that God has used. It, it requires a spiritual fortitude and vision. Right. Go yeah. on. If you don't have vision, so Prophet says, without vision, without divine revelation, vision, my people perish, they disintegrate and fall apart. So it's very important for people to have vision. And so why do I stay in this with these people that are captive and go into all this darkness? Where you go into that spiritual death where they are to extract them out. 
uh, it takes the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Christian life is the life of Jesus Christ in the resurrection, or it's not the Christian life. So uh, we learned that through Adrian Thomas and his, his ministry when he was with us. Uh, so it's having the right kind of ministry. People can go online and under the sermon index and listen to the uh, sermons by Major and Thomas. And you're asking, you know, how do we get through this? It's messages like this, right? That Christ is our life. Christ is the, he's the wisdom and the power of God. Jesus Christ is the grace of God operational in us through the Holy Spirit. So, uh, and what motivates me? The enemy has captured God's people. And let's go in and take him out. And, and I mean aggressive, strategic, second heaven warfare until he's replaced. Demons are one thing. They're, they're not a problem at all. I've been involved with thousands of exorcisms. They're nothing. But when you, the demons and fallen angels are not the same. You don't have the prince of Persia begging Jesus to go into a pig. Daniel 10. So if you're going to, if you're going to display... You, principalities and powers those that are attached in a person's did system the only way they're going to be removed is not through exorcism it's by displacement you can cast out a demon but you cannot cast out a principality they have to be displaced that's an inheritance issue and god told the children of israel to go in and take possession of the land of canaan that was occupied by hybrids giants those are hybrids yeah you you got to go in and you got to disinherit them. If you're going to inherit, you have to displace or disinherit them. So it's a matter of displacement. So we learned that through Francis Frangipane, the three battlefields. We read that. And so it's having the right uh, um, mental framework and spiritual framework to have the motive that this is for the Lord. The enemy occupies this like the Jebusite fortress in the time of David. The Jebusites occupied that fortress. But when Jesus, when uh, David was unified, northern, southern kingdom, First Chronicles 11, 12, and they unified, and they had one heart to make David king. Once the northern, southern kingdom came together to make David king, what was his, the first thing he did? He took the Jebusite fortress. Jerusalem had already been taken back from the enemy, but there was a stronghold right there in the center of Jerusalem. And what is that stronghold? Today it's called Mount Zion. And so David captured that. And he now occupies, it became the stronghold of David or the stronghold of the Lord. So it's the same way with his people that are SRIDID. What motivates me? That which Satan created to be his stronghold in the body of Christ. Let's go take it. Let's dismantle it and allow the Lord to come and occupy that stronghold that Satan created to be for himself in the body of Christ. And so that's what this is about to me. Wow. Yeah, that that's that's incredible uh, to hear, and it takes me back to your testimony when, when you you finally were so broken, you cried out to God and said, you know, I no longer want to control my life. You you gave Him the keys, um, and you're now letting Him Him drive. Um, it's, so it, it's incredible to see uh, that He's using in this way, and also reminds me uh, of Christ when He was standing at, at the gates of hell, and He said. Um, what did you say? These 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 gates will not uh, be able to withstand. Um, and you know, if you look at that verse, you know, gates are the gate. Even the he said not even the gates of hell would able to withstand. And those gates are meant to keep people out. And so what I'm seeing that you know you're doing here is you're reaching in and you're you're rescuing these people from uh, from bondage and it's it's, it's oh. pretty incredible to see that the, the power um you know that we have in, in christ to do that um so that makes a lot of sense um for you to have a, a vision to keep you carrying on about that so that's encouraging to hear um wow okay so I, a couple follow-up questions i had you know when, when you're 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 kind of discovering there's people uh that have undergone this um satanic ritual abuse and they've uh have this you know multiple personality dissociative did uh, dissociative identity disorder um you're finding out that the purpose of this is to essentially poison the church and yeah, also finding there's also another purpose is to 
uh, create these hybrids. And that's, I imagine, for a smaller portion of people that you're working with, I imagine. Um, so I have a, a few questions, but I guess we can uh, talk about um, you know, this BREAM program that you just discovered. Uh, what's the purpose of the hybrid program? Well, a couple things. Uh, I think it was Dr. Chuck Missler. Uh, he made a comment one time, and I thought about this, when Satan fell, when he rebelled against God, and that's prior to the creation of Adam. So there was a long history of Satan as the king of the earth before Adam was created. So when he was cast out of heaven, the result is told well above Genesis 1-2. We don't know how long that was. Right, yeah. But he, he had a history. Yeah. And so when Adam is created, he shows up on the scene as Nakash, the shining one, the one who practices divination, who is also translated as a serpent. Nakash has three different root meanings. So um, ask me my question again. I got to say the, the purpose, the purpose of the hybrid program. Oh, yeah, that's right. So um, Satan, when he fell, he took one third with him, one third went with him, I guess you put it that way. And so uh, that leaves two thirds of the elect angels that are with God. So in Satan's mind, if he's going to overthrow God, I'm going to be like the most high. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I am basically going to take the place of God. In his arrogance, he wants to displace God. So how is he going to do that? If he's only, he only has one third. Now that they've fallen, they're actually inferior to the elect. So not only are these are only a third, but they are not, they, they are degenerated in terms of their original divine status as being elect angels. So they're two thirds with God, one third with Satan. So what's he going to do? He's got to come up with something. So how can I come up with a plan that I can create an army so that when Jesus returns, Revelation 19, 19, and he wages war against the lamb returning from heaven. And who's returning with him? His bride, the church. It's right there, Revelation 19, That's six, six and seven and following. So how's he going to, he's going to have to come up with something. So he's got to create an army that, in his mind, will be a greater army than that which is God's. Now, is that realistic? Maybe not to us, but what other option does he have? So he's going to create a hybrid army. That's also spoken of in the non-canonical books of uh, Enoch and Jasher and things like that. So he has to create an army uh, that will be on the field of Armageddon that are uh, beasts. Therion, the Antichrist and the false prophet, are both hybrids. We know that. How do we know? When Jesus returns, the second advent, Revelation 19, 20, they're both thrown in the lake of fire when he returns. They don't even show up the gray or white throne judgment. You look at Revelation 19, 20 and compare, uh, compare that with Revelation 20, verse 10. A thousand years later, when Satan is thrown in the lake of fire, it says he's thrown in the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. They've already been there a thousand. So yeah. they're hybrids. And so uh, Satan is creating a deficit. Plus, he wants to replace mankind. Uh, he wants to create a species that will replace mankind so that that species will be that which is his offspring. Yeah. He cannot ultimately rule over mankind unless it's something of his seed. Yeah. So the seed of the serpent will ultimately be the Antichrist. And all those that take the mark of the beast, that's going to be not just a, in a, a qualifier to buy, trade, and sell, but it's going to change your DNA. And you will be like gods, like Genesis 3, 5, 6. You will not die. You'll have God. So you'll be like Elohim. You'll be like God. So uh, he's got a deception. And he, his goal is to infect the entire human race. And the vaccines, by the way, is just the preparatory stages for this. It's getting everybody compliant. And when everybody gets sick, uh, gets sicker, because all this is not going to solve the problem. And then when he when they when the restrainer is removed, I believe with the rapture of the church, and I've covered that in my video section, is then the restrainer will be removed, Antichrist will be revealed, and mankind will say, Wow, now 
we can attain godhood. We can we can take this DNA upgrade and we can be like God. And yeah, we won't be able to buy, trade, or sell, but we won't be fully human anymore and no longer savable because everyone that takes the mark of the beast is going to be damned. And so uh, Satan's goal is to wipe out the human race. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, unless those days be shortened, that is the days of leading up to the coming of the Son of Man there in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. If those days had not been shortened, no flesh would survive. And people think, oh, David will blow everybody up. Uh, they, no, there would be no flesh savable. Yeah. His goal is that there's not going to be anything human that can be saved. And that's the deception. So if you can draw people into the net and web saying, oh, you will not die, you'll live forever. Um, like we see in Genesis 3, 5, and 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2 says, those who do not receive the love of the truth will be, will then be, uh, God will send upon them a supernatural activity leading to error that they might believe. And the Greek says, the lie. The Antichrist is quintessential. You can be like him. You can have this superhuman status. You can just take this little DNA upgrade. Right. And so uh, that's his goal, is to... Uh, wipe out mankind and mankind so that proves god a liar and uh after the rapture of the church who does he go after he goes after israel why to prove god a liar then when jesus returns isaiah 59 many other passages there won't be any jews left and we see in revelation 12 when in the middle of the tribulation when the jews eyes are open and see that who the antichrist is they flee they flee uh matthew 24 and Ma revelation chapter 12 they go into a place of hiding there's a remnant so when Jesus returns, there's a remnant of Jews left. Why, why, is, it, why is that so? Because Satan it says in Revelation 12, he's going to wipe out the rest of her seed, the seed of the woman. And uh, so it's a very clear strategy. I mean, I, I, I see what the enemy's up to. I know what he's after. To me, there's no mystery to it. It all fits together. I mean, there are no missing dots for me when it comes to what he's up to. It's just now walking out God's plan because God is who he is. We see the end of the book, you know, we already know who wins, but getting there is a real challenge. Yeah. There's no question about that, that those who belong to God are, are on the winning side, but we're not there yet. And uh, it's not about losing salvation. It has everything to do with our inheritance. It's about who's going to rule and reign with him. Because if we endure with him, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, we, he will deny us the reign. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. He can't deny us salvation. But it's the rain. Those who suffer with him will shall also be glorified with him. Romans uh, eight seventeen. So the, it's about inheritance. It's not about you know are you going to get lose your salvation. So once we're saved, we're we're conscripted according to Second Timothy two as soldiers. We're we're now born again into a battlefield. And what is God doing? We're on training to become among the true Ubermensch. <laughs> but not not the nazi kind yeah. the sons of god glorified because yeah. once the church is glorified we're going to displace satan and principalities and powers we're going to be taking their place hebrews chapter 2 verse 5 it's not unto angels that god has submitted the habit of the world to come but somewhere it says what is man so we are in the church we are being trained to occupy that position as paul confronts the church at corinth and they were taking saints to, to law court, civil court, it wasn't criminal courts, over probably financial things, property issues. Why are you taking people to the law court? Can, isn't there a wise man among you that could uh, adjudicate and settle this in your midst? What's wrong with you? Don't you know, saints, that the saints are going to judge the world, that the saints are going to judge angels? Don't you get it? Yeah. So I did a whole series on that, and it's in the video section called The Celestial Court four-part series of why the church is going to be in heaven during the great and terrible day of the Lord, because we're the assessors to the judge. We're there judging angels. So it has to do with a high calling. It has to do with vision. It has to do with understanding the, the tremendous download that, uh, that Jesus Christ gave to Paul in prison. You got that vision? You're going to go all the way through to the end. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, wow. So, um, I, I have specific questions I wanted to ask you, uh, so I want to kind of get started on, on, sure. on some of those, or I may sure. not uh, get to them. 
Um, so some of these are a little bit more, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll call it nerdy questions. They're, you know, kind of um, real specific. But uh, so I kind of want to start with kind of some of the things we see kind of in, in you know, modern day counseling. Um, so one thing I heard on, on a previous interview, uh, I think this is one that you did with Preston Bailey. Um, and I think I've actually heard uh, rapper Lecrae talk about this. He read a, a, a journal, something about how the body doesn't forget. And I've heard uh, you speak about body memories. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain what those are and then how do you uh, heal uh, a painful body memory? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, body memory is a misnomer. Uh, Dr. Basil van der Kolk, Dr. Basil van der Kolk, who is a world-renowned medical doctor, psychiatrist, uh, he wrote a book called, called uh, titled The Body Keeps Score. And as a medical doctor, uh, there's a symptomatology of trauma, which I read his book, not because I, it's a Christian book, but because if a, if a counselor is working with trauma uh, survivors, if you just want to anoint them with oil and try to cast out demons, you're going to do damage. You need to understand what DID is. You need to know and understand the symptomatology of trauma, or you're not going to help these people. I know I've been there and it didn't work. Okay. Uh, try to pray them into wholeness or read the Bible over them and tell them to go home and read their Bible and all that. Well, that's fine. You can do that. And I think God honors that. But getting to back to your specifically your question, when somebody is traumatized, uh, there is psychological trauma, there's spiritual trauma, but they're in a body that goes through the trauma. And sometimes when the soul is just so overwhelmed in the core identity, the memories are still there. In other words, there's somatic trauma. And when the, psycho the psychological aspect, the spiritual, the solical aspect of a person is just so overwhelmed in trauma, it's stored in the body. It becomes a cellular trauma and so when i'm working with someone uh for example and there's maybe affective there's emotional trauma that's there they have react this is all clinical people can look up psychological trauma ab reactions what that means and so you can work with a person in dealing with uh, traumatic memories and they have react and there may be affective the emotions come forward and uh, they, they'll have the picture the cognitive and they see that but memory is in really four different categories. It's affective, it's somatic, it's um, uh, volitional, behavioral, and then uh, cognitive. But when you're getting to the somatic memory, that's some of the deepest. When I see a person and I'm sitting in front of me and where they're abreacting, they're going into a traumatic memory, they will have all kinds of pains. Um, they could have, for example, I was working with this man one time and he's had all this pain and the and he says, my arm is, it's painful. What's going on? He showed me and uh, he showed me his arm and there was a raised, it looked like a brand of a cross in his arm. Just showed on his arm. Looked like a brand. Yeah. Just showed up. That's a traumatic somatic memory. That's the body keeps score. So it wasn't, it was something that happened, but he couldn't, it could not be verbalized. The trauma is so deep and so powerful it's recorded somatically. And so when that memory state comes forward, it appears as a somatic memory and people call that as a body memory. So when I see that, I know what to do with it and help that be released and speak into it and call forward the person that was in that traumatic event and open your eyes and see where you are now because in their mind, they're still all curled up, you crunched up inside with their eyes closed and they're in a frozen state of trauma. And so I speak through and I said, are your eyes open or closed? And they said, no, they're closed. And I said, I'm, I want to invite you to open your eyes. You're in the memory and see where your body is now. What happened to you is real, but it's no longer happening. I want you to come. They'll come out and they'll look around. You're not little anymore. Look at your hands. See what you're wearing because they're always naked in a ritual. See what you're wearing. And I do grounding techniques. And that helps them reassociate and come out of a traumatic memory. Wow. Um, yeah, so that was definitely a different understanding. Um, I mean, others, are, can people experience that on a smaller scale? You know, there's something that's maybe less traumatic. Um, 
you know, for example, like a, a car wreck and now I approach a red light, can I, you know, can I experience pain or feel my body tense up? Would that be the same phenomenon just on a smaller scale? Yeah, I mean, if there's been a traumatic uh, experience and if we are in a, an environment that seems to be like the original experience, like if it's I, I got T-boned at a, at, a, at a light, then I may have a sense of anxiety as I'm going through a light or especially if I'm in the same area where I had the accident, then there can be a trigger of anxiety without DID at all. And that just means that's more of a PTSD kind of uh, um, category, not necessarily DID. And that can be dealt with with a somebody who is really an effective and knows what they're doing in terms of theophostic counseling. And that, that kind of memory can be resolved very quickly. Okay, um, so I want to talk about something also that's very common. Uh, we'll see more and more. I'm hearing more and more about it, our panic attacks. Uh, how much have you worked with that? Um, how much of that is uh, psychological? How much of that is spiritual? Yeah. Usually, if there's a trauma history, uh, it's not either or. It's, it's usually both. Yeah. In other words, uh, if they have panic and it's, if we pray and it's not going away, it's not being resolved, I just speak to it. I just, in Jesus' name, I speak to the source of the trauma and command the absolute source of this trauma to glorify Jesus Christ or be removed. Get out. And what cannot be removed to be released and present where your body is now. So that would be an example of protocol that I use. So if they're dissociated, so you're you're in panic. What's going on? What happened? You I release you, and they may come out all startled and all covering their face. I said, "Okay, just wait a minute. You're in a memory. Where are you? Open your eyes." And they're coming out of a place where they were an infant. And soon as they're released out of that dissociated traumatic memory in the past, the symptoms go away. And so some of the affective or anxiety or panic is coming from a dissociated place. It's leaking into the present. And if it doesn't go away with prayer and you can't resolve it there, then I follow it to its source. Um, I think it's on my website under SRIDID. If it's a DID issue, it's the phenomenology of SRIDID and the image of God. That's an article I wrote 23 years ago that addresses this. Uh, you got to get to the source of the trauma. And uh, panic can be just the kind of a response to a, a foundational traumatic event. Yeah. Um, there was, um, uh, okay. So once again, getting some nerdy questions here, I had an experience, um, years ago, I was at a college fundraiser and they had brought in a hypnotist for entertainment and the hypnotist said, okay, whoever wants to volunteer, come on stage. And they did their little thing, you know, kind of put everybody to sleep, boom, snap, you're gone. Um, and I think through different series, people kind of came off stage that weren't experiencing the hypnosis until there was maybe a couple under a handful of people still on the stage. And so it was done. And I think she had programmed uh, whoever's on the stage. OK, whenever I snap my fingers or I say a certain word, you're going to quack like a duck or something like that. So the thing was done everyone's dismissed, everyone comes off stage, um, and there is an individual, I think there's only one person that actually was able to have this experience, but she she gave the trigger word or whatever it was, and then all of a sudden he starts quacking like a duck I, or something like that, I can't quite remember, but I'll never forget because when he kind of noticed that everyone in the room was laughing, he was confused and, and he had no idea what they were laughing about. And someone had to explain to him, hey, you were quacking like a duck. Um, so, you know, I think about that experience and I, you know, I, I see how this kind of dovetails with some of the work that you've done. So I wanted to ask you about it specifically. Um, what is that? Uh, can, you, can you explain that? Um, yeah. yeah, it's pretty simple. Uh, everybody in the crowd, ha in that crowd has, uh, a semi-normal upbringing. Anybody in that crowd that was uh, abused and has trauma and dissociated, uh, they're the 
prime, they're the, the candidates that can be hypnotized. Somebody tried to hypnotize me one time, didn't work because I'm not, I'm not dissociated. Okay. So a person who is dissociated is very easily led into that kind of experience where through like a, 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 that kind of, if you want to call it programming, a suggestion, they will just do it. Because the, the kid is already, uh, he's already dissociated. Now, if you take somebody that doesn't have a trauma history and you do that, nothing would have happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it, these are just indicators. It's the same thing with the abduction phenomenon. People, everyone that's been abducted, they talk about the same thing. It's they're taking sperm and ovum and uh, they're aliens and all this kind of thing. And they have missing time. 100% of all the abductees have missing time. You know why they have missing time? Because they're dissociated. The UFO ended up landed in the street down there and some hybrid moron stepped out of it. Do you think I would miss time? Are you kidding me? I wouldn't miss time. There's nothing they could do to make me miss time because I'm not dissociated. So 100% of those people that are UFO, that they all have missing time, that's a typical DID phenomenon. Hmm. So the, uh, the whole, I, I remember I was talking to Russ Dizdar uh, about this a number of years ago, who's, uh, you know, he's boy, worked in this for many years, 35 years or so. Um, uh, we're talking to him about um, when he went to Roswell, because they have one of these <clears throat> annual UFO uh, conventions and people show up that are abductees and they all show up there. And I uh, said, so what was that like? And he talked to different ones. And he said, in his, in his observation, they're all they're all DID. The ones he met. So all these people that, you know, it's all a cover up. There's no aliens. There are hybrids out there, and you know they're 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 for real. But if the, Satan wants you to believe they're aliens and they're going to someday come to rescue us, it's all a big false flag that the enemy is going to use to bring deception. So. That may be a little bit, a little bit off, but uh, anyone that has been subjected to chronic trauma that's unres unresolved are very hip uh, hypnotizable, if I can use that term. It can be easily yeah. hypnotized. So I want to ask you um, about the disassociation um, a little bit more, because this is kind of, for, for a layman, for someone that doesn't have really too much background, my understanding. I want to check and see if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, so the only like real frame of reference I have, I don't, have you ever seen the movie Fight Club before? I have not. I sounds familiar, but I don't remember. What's the thing? So, so the, the main character um, has a, an apartment and he has all these like collectibles, really rare items. And that's kind of like his life is just really has sort of a, a real lame life. And the apartment catches on fire. And so for him, that trauma of going through that experience of losing everything that he has in his life, he uh, creates, um, I guess, a, a split, another personality. And in this movie, he's interacting with it. He doesn't realize that this is um, a personality that he created. But the personality was created was created as a way, as like a defense mechanism so that he could get through this trauma so the the personality was kind of the opposite of who he was in a lot of ways he was aggressive where he, the the main guy was very assertive um he was very messy he didn't really care about being neat where, where he was a very neat person so um is that why someone would split is as a defense mechanism to to, to deal with the trauma and, and the other question I had is like, how was that personality determined? Is it, is it based off of that uh, defense mechanism? Well, there's, there's some different ways in which that could be understood with the individuals, but I would just say basically that just foundationally, uh, a child that is born into the world where they have you know, parents that are nurturing and that child is not subject to any you know, trauma, babies dissociate all the time. But if there's no trauma, they, they just, they're just very malleable. Their, their identities are very, very vulnerable. And so when a child is subjected to chronic trauma in early childhood, their identity fragments. And with each traumatic episode, the 
separation, the splitting process begins to aggregate into a separate ego state. And that ego state will maybe be carry the pain, may carry the anger, may carry the shame. It's not one episode, it has to be chronic because DID can only be formed through chronic abuse in early childhood. The more chronic the abuse, the more dense the amnesia. So the different splits off of the identity, if it's purposeful, they're given names, roles, functions, and assignments. If it's reactive, it's just to survive. But mm -hmm. basically, uh, to survive when it's trauma-based mind control, when they purposely induce the trauma and they take the person, severe trauma and into death and then resuscitate them. When they resuscitate them, they'll say, well, you're now Satan. You're now the devil. This is what your assignment is. And it just, it's just there. And so they believe they're the devil. They believe they're evil. So yeah. the defense mechanism is when they split and they become whoever they need to be to survive. But if it's trauma-based mind control, you're assigned an identity. If it's reactive DID and you're just growing up in a chaotic family, it'll just be a random kind of assignment. So in this situation would be more like a reactive DID response to trauma. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, very rarely does someone in that kind of trauma, I mean, if he created a part in that singular trauma, no way would that happen unless he was already dissociated. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. A movie, it's a movie. But it's a movie, but in re real life, you could not create this very distinct separate altar with a different function, different perception of reality, unless he was already dissociated somewhere between birth and age six. Gotcha. So as if an adult goes, undergoes even chronic trauma, they're not going to disassociate. No, they'll, they'll experience PTSD. PTSD. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, that was one of my questions as well. Um, so here's another movie I want to reference as well. Uh, have you seen a movie called Split? You know, I started to, but it looks so violent. And so, uh, so what do I want to say? R-rated. I, I, yeah. I didn't need to, to be identified with a trauma, but it really did, uh, it really did show something of the nature of, of violence and splitting, what I did see. Yeah, so um, one thing, um, and I guess I have a follow-up question about, about the other movie I referenced as well, um, but I think I heard this addressed in one of the interviews you did with Preston Bailey about how the different personalities uh, can take on different physical changes. Um, and in this movie, it's like a, like a super strength but is it is it possible for a different personality to to alter someone physically? Whereas maybe they, you know, I think I heard you talk about a different personality no no longer needing to use uh, reading glasses, or they have a different uh, eye color, or there's a disability they no longer have. Is is that an, ex an experience that can happen? Um, I've heard people talk about when people change and they have different uh, physiological changes. Uh, every multi I've worked with, I have not seen the kind of changes that have been reported. I've seen eye changes. I've seen eyes go black because of some demonic activity. But the basic phenome, or that is the what you see, is remains the same. Now, if another person is there, you take two people that are DID. And this person says, I saw that person change into a werewolf. Okay, they actually saw that because they're both demonized. They're sharing spirits. And so the demons are creating a shared phenomenology. So this person manifests a wolf and this person sees a werewolf. If I was present, I wouldn't see it. Why? Because it's the phenomenology of, D, uh, of DID plus demonic enhancement. So... Uh, I don't get caught up in the phenomenology of a demonized person. Yeah. They, they're, I'm, they're, the, the, the reality of what they went through is trauma-based, but I have learned through the years to help them sort out what is a phenomenological perception of reality versus actual reality. And that, yeah. that is a gradual process that in their dividedness, as they become more and more integrated, they know the truth for themselves. 
wherever there's still division inside, they have a perception of what they went through traumatically, but when they actually continue the process of integration, they know the truth. I don't have to tell them. And I've never seen anybody change from if they saw something that, what about this? I saw my brother change into a werewolf. I'll ask them after they're integrated, what do you think happened? I said, that's because in that separate part of me, I had demonic attachments and that's what I saw was real. They know, I don't have to tell them. Yeah. So I just say, do the work of integration, get it, bring every, every aspect together that's been separated through trauma and it'll be their history and their truth. And that won't originate from me. I don't have to tell them a thing. I don't have to sort out anything that may have happened. For example, if I work with people and they come up with all kinds of things that I would, that I just, you know, I would say, I, this doesn't sound real to me at all. I don't do anything with it because I'm not responsible. I do the trauma work. I stay with on the trajectory of resolving core conflict, that which maintains division, bringing the, the parts together. And when they come together, they know the truth. I don't have to do anything. So I don't get caught up in any of the anecdotal phenomenology of, of that which they perceive as reality. It really happened. And there's a lot of stuff going on that can be val verified all over the world that's real. But uh, for me, it's very simple. I just, I just keep doing the DID work. Yeah. When they're integrated, it's their story and they know the truth. So I need you to do a follow-up question and it, it might uh, dovetail with what you're speaking about earlier with the abduction phenomenon. Um, so I, I heard you speak about the difference between demonic possession and demonic attachment that you just mentioned just now. And mm -hmm. I wanted some clarity on that. Um, you know, my understanding of demonic possession is you're actually inhabited and controlled by a demonic entity. Um, is attachment just a, 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 like a torment? Um, what is the difference between the two? Okay. So if, uh, like you see the gathering demoniac that Jesus met uh, with the legion of demons. Yeah. Let's just say from the text itself, that this is one person, he's not split, and he is so demonized that he has 6,000 demons in him. Okay? All right? That person, he's not saved, so technically he's possessed. So possessed means you're owned. Yeah. It's possession. And so the Greek word demon possession is just daimonizomai. Literally translated means demonized. So if an unbeliever is demonized, technically you could translate that is demon possession. If you take a Christian who is demonized, he can't be possessed. But those particular trauma, trauma, anger states in him, if you go into the who they are in their DID structure that holds the anger, that identity domain, you, it would look like possession to you. But since it's not the whole person, it's demonized. In other words, there, there's a, a demonic attachment to that dissociated realm, that, especially that holds their anger. And so hmm. when it comes to watching it, uh, there's you wouldn't tell the difference because I, I do exorcism. I get them out. Yeah. Yeah. I do yeah. detox. I get them out of the way. Yeah. And then uh, release that trauma and that anger can be here that's not so toxic and so fearful. But technically, a believer cannot be possessed because he belongs to the Lord. But clearly, believers can be demonized. I'll just tell you a short story. Uh, is kind of a background Dallas. I, I did, but there's no way a Christian could be demon possessed. It just, I just it was out of the question. I could argue do down uh, through the Bible, you know, uh, yeah. and all this. And then I, uh, there's this woman that was in our assembly back in the mid '80s. Just two, simple mom, two kids, just, just the most sweet woman i mean you would you know she just like to be ideal mom yeah one day she comes knocking on my door and she's just hyperventilating and she's saying really fast i'm not the devil's child i'm not the devil's child i'm not the devil's child and she had a bible and she's kind of rocking like this and i said judy what's going on come in she's knocking on the door she's terrified yeah she kind of walks in kind of you know kind of somber and, and what's going on julie i'm not the devil's child i'm not the devil's child come in sit down let's see what's going on and so we sit down 
and we're there. And she'd been in our church for a number of years. I mean, she's just to me, she's just a normal mom, you know. We're sitting there, she's so distressed, and then she starts rocking again and going into this mantra: I'm not devil child, I'm not devil child, I'm not because what I didn't know now at the time, there's voices in her head. And if I knew, I didn't even know about MPD back then. Right. So I, I knew that she, looking back now, she's multiple, but I didn't know at the time. So what I, what I did, she's doing there. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, stop this. And she just went, kind of dropped her head. And I can't remember if she turned and looked at me, but in a guttural voice, male voice, you can't have her. She's mine. And I knew she was a believer. And so I, I was so provoked. I was just outraged. Yeah. I put my hand on her and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you get out of her. You, whoever you are, you get out of here now. And, you, and I mean, I was furious. And she dropped to the floor, slithering on the floor, spinning and slithering like a snake. And now I know she was DID. I didn't realize it. And this went on for quite a while. If it would just been a demon possessed person, it'd be done with. But it went on for quite a while. And finally, after uh, however long, she finally settled down and she got some relief. But knowing what I know now, when she went on the ground as a snake, I just said, oh, so you're a snake. Huh? I bless you in Jesus' name and I release you to be here as a person. Because probably in ritual abuse, uh, she was traumatized with snakes and to, she split and, and her mind goes into the snake. The snake comes into her. And that's how she survived is by adapting and assuming the identity of a snake. And I just did that the other day. It is very simple. I released that person from the snake identity to be here as a person. And whatever demonic attachment was there was removed. So had I known what I'd known now, this would have been done in uh, less than 15 seconds or a minute. Uh, as it was when I first met this person, uh, you know, was quote unquote possessed. Um, we probably, this probably went on for over an hour because I didn't know what I was doing yeah so anyway she's a christian she was demonized but she was not possessed i got you so to cure a split you know you bring forth uh that identity and um it's just explain for me how how we get rid of that identity well you don't get rid of the identity it's how does that identity become begin to be incorporated into the original person i got you so it's because you can't get rid of an identity because there's humanity. Yeah. Um, so what I will do is, uh, first of all, the the core trauma, the core trauma in the person that all the system is created off on the DID parts. There's a singularity there. And it's silence, dead, the invisible, I don't exist, just terribly abused, no <laughs> voice. And so um, what I do is it's a process to get all this organized so that there can be a gradual uh, assimilation into unification. But the foundational trauma produces uh, um, shame because of the sexual violation, a terror, um, confusion, there, and a lot of pain. And so the core person, terror, uh, tremendous trauma, shame, whatever pain is there that's the core now whenever anything happens to a person that is a violation something in that person knows this is wrong they don't think it out but they react so the primary traumatic event is what i said shame terror pain okay the reaction secondary response is always is always anger and so if I'm going to resolve somebody, it's a sad resolve, you know, with the Lord and how we do this, is I always, we always have to get to the secondary response to primary trauma. The reason why people are not being resolved with their, uh, their primary trauma is because if you go to the anger, this is the one that's done the rituals. This is the one that's done the most horrific things that the presenter doesn't ever want to see. Yeah. So you got protection. You've got to resolve the anger. So I... I always try to find out who in you holds the anger in response to the original person's primary trauma. Who holds your anger? You see that as human or you see that as non-human? Who holds your anger? Some say, well, that's Apollyon or that's the devil. 
Well, all right, let's go there. If they can have devil identity there and validate the anger, anger you speak, you don't have to be Christian. You just, why are you angry? And draw it out, get it out, validate it. And as you diffuse the anger, you, have, you begin to have access to core trauma. So this is all clinical. There's nothing really super spiritual about this. Anybody that is clinically trained and understands DID and has worked with DID people, they do this and they're not Christians. Right. So uh, I do this because it's a, it's a procedure that is recognizing that there's real trauma here and you have to deal with the trauma. You can't pray it away. And so we work in this way to, to, for the person to reconcile with themselves and see that that angry part that has been so evil and perceived to be most like the devil, that when the, the adult person seeking help, the presenter, you begin to embrace that and, to, and reconcile because they're not separate people. These are facets of one person, very broken. And yeah. so I never allow myself to get caught up with that these different identity domains are different people. I never try to lead them to Jesus. Never. I never send them to Jesus. That never works. I've heard people say, oh, just send the elders to Jesus. Oh, really? Everyone I've worked with, everyone has an antichrist Jesus inside. So how's that going to work? I never found an exception. So I deal with the DID. I don't get caught up in the phenomenology of DID. I have one person sitting in front of me. They don't know it, but I stay on track with that and stay with de de doing the DID work. Uh, conflict resolution is a real key. Dealing with the anger and then making a way for the, the traumatic core to begin to be released and integrated into the present. Wow. Oh. Um... That's amazing. So can a, a host uh, talk to uh, one of their separate identities? Can they? Oh, yeah, I, I encourage that. This, I read a book a number of years ago. His name, his name is Dr. Frank Putnam, MD. Not a Christian. Uh, he wrote a book called The Diagnosis and Treatment of Multiple Personality Disorder. It was a $52 book back in the early 90s. I read it. And it was, I still use those protocols today um, uh, in resolving conflict and, uh, and moving towards integration. Um, he used a process called talk through. You have a presenter that's amnesic behind. And so I just do a lot of talk through, knowing that they're quote unquote people on the backside listening and the presenter doesn't know. So I do talk through all the time. Mm -hmm. So when something, when someone comes forward seeking help, the presenter person, I do a talk through and there's, and invite the, the person, the, that which is in the background, to come forward. If they can't come forward, then I'm going to ask the person presenting, you don't go away. I'm not asking you to dissociate. You just step aside, as it were, and allow that person that's there in the background before you ever created to be a presenter to come forward. And uh, I say, okay, you're so-and-so. Do you have a different name? Okay. This presenter that came in for help, what do you think of her? Well, she's stupid. She doesn't know anything. I said, what do you not like? What is it about her? Well, she, she thinks Jesus is going to help her. Okay. So what do you think? Well, he's never helped anybody. He's never showed up. I said, what's he like? Tell me about this Jesus. You know? um, well, he abandoned us. I said, what else? Well, he raped us. Okay. Does the presenter know this? No, the presenter, does, the presenter doesn't have a clue. I said, well, I'm going to invite you to stay forward, right? I'm going to ask, you stay here, I'm going to speak, right? With you here, I'm going to speak to the presenter that came in for help today, and I'm going to ask the presenter, without you going away, are you willing to give up all that's kept you separate and start coming into who you are right here? A check for protection, that which maintains amnesia, and uh, our work until there's a reconciliation and the presenter comes into that core part that has never been here before. And I keep doing that, relaying relaying until there's no more parts wow um okay so this will be um one of my last follow-ups and then we'll kind of get into a kind of a different stream of questions uh but i kind of want to go back to what you mentioned about the alien abduction phenomena uh just to clarify so you know for someone that has did uh are you saying that that missing time is another identity that's experiencing this mm -hmm. and that it's missing because they 
experienced it through a different identity? Mm -hmm. And is this, is it, is there still a physical phenomena that's happening there? Sure. Yeah, there's physical. Yeah. Okay. There are, there are actually uh, craft. Uh, we know the TR-3B dash made in America can fly anywhere where in the world in 15 minutes. It's uh, black, black ops and things like that. Uh, so there's that stuff going on all the, under the ruse of aliens. But um, what happens when a person is triggered, like say one of these hybrids show up, and if you people have never read Dr. David Jacobs' books, The Threat, he's a, not a Christian, but he's a, he's, he's a professor, he's a PhD. Uh, he's retired now, but he taught ufology at uh, Templeton University in Pennsylvania. It's the only accredited ufology course in America at the time. So he wrote the threat and he followed up the threat with They Walk Among Us. And he recognized in his 40 years of working with uh, abductees that um, this is not, a, uh, this is not a, uh, an experiment, this is a program. And it's incremental and they're, they're integrating. And the goal is we're gonna be replaced, we're gonna be their slaves and they're gonna be our masters. So, uh, when it comes to this whole uh, uh, UFO uh, phenomenon, what happens is those, all, every one of those abductees, as I've, as I've listened to them, watched them, missing time is a, is a symptom, is symptom of dissociative identity disorder. They call it psych, psychogenic fugue. In other words, if someone is triggered and they switch, the presenter is, is gone yeah. and something of the core person will come out usually and take over and then when the environment is changed back to normal the presenter will come back and then only there's two or three hours days go. why because something of their uh, deeper core self came forward and took over in this traumatic situation and every abduction is traumatic it's always a death yeah, yeah. there's there's they're doing experimentation they're extracting sperm ovum it's very invasive so it's traumatic. And so once the person's back, they've lost all this time. Well, that's very typical of someone who's DID. They always lose time. So it's a dead giveaway to me. And yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, all right. So like I said, I want to get into a, a, a kind of a different stream of, of questions. Um, but before that, like I said, I do have one last question. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, earlier uh, attract uh, to create a uh, false prophet, attract to create the Antichrist. Is it your understanding that, that those hybrids uh, exist today and are waiting to present themselves? Yeah, a lot of the UFO phenomena, they say, well, they're alien greys and then there's reptilian. Uh, these are, um, in other words, when you're messing with God's genetics, you're going to get all kinds of mutations. You, this is not, you know, everything is according to God's kind in Genesis. So when you're messing with uh, God's creation and crossing these genetic barriers, you're, you're, you're creating, you're cre it's a lot of, I mean, it's horrific. Uh, and so the people who have been in the DUMB, Deep Underground Military Bases, have re reported all kinds of experimentation going on where they're hybrids being created for this last day's army. I mean, Satan's very invested in this. And so some of these entities are, are not, they don't look human. I mean, they're well, the greys and they're reptilian and some of them are very violent, um, but they're not aliens. This is a part of the project. But the Antichrist and false prophet, the DNA that creates them is directly from Satan, what we've now uh, come to understand. The Antichrist doesn't look like a gray. The Antichrist doesn't look like a reptilian. He looks like a quintessential man. He's perfect man. He's ubermensch. And so, but that DNA source code is directed from Satan to create Antichrist. These others can come through various forms of manipulation by men in, in you know, underground bases and labs. That's going on. People all over the world have reported being in these facilities, okay? So we're not talking about that. That's part of the Joel 2 army, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. We see that army that is a part of the end time army of Armageddon. It's not, they're not just grasshoppers and locusts. This is really an army at the end. Um, but, but the Antichrist and false prophet, these are quintessential men. This, in other words, 
this particular species is first generation offspring. Satan has the DNA source code. This is very different. And so since Satan doesn't know who the final antichrist and false prophet will be, he has to create a resource pool. And so those that are the bloodline, those that have been selected to be part of the project, to be the, the, the mothers, the breeders, to produce this quintessential hybrid. Um, for the Nimrod Apollyon, that's Antichrist, Michael, the false prophet, there are a number uh, of these um, resources, resource identities in place. So Satan doesn't know exactly when the last emergent um, Antichrist false prophet will emerge to be the actual one. He has to have him ready. And what we've seen through the years is as we move forward, there's, there's becoming less and less. Some of the others are sacrificed. The power is, got, is transferred to the next one. And so in the, when the final Antichrist and false prophet emerge, which I, they're, I believe they're already here. But they cannot be released because they're restrained. Second Thessalonians 2 says they're restrained until the restrainer is removed out of the way. Oh, who's going to restrain them? Somebody said, well, oh, they think it's Lucifer. Oh, really? Lucifer's restraining Antichrist? Come on. It takes a member of the Godhead to restrain Antichrist. You yeah. know? So anyway, when the restrainer is removed, and I believe that'll take place when the church is removed, the Holy Spirit will still be here, but the restrainer will be removed and all hell is going to break loose. You know, first of all, great deception and all that kind of thing. So the quintessential hybrids are those that are the resource entities that are leading up to the final release and emergence of the beast, antichrist, false prophet, and they will be quintessential. They will be the kind of the, the result of the evolutionary process of this particular species of the DNA source code coming from directly from Satan that will emerge as the final world ruler. And they are going to be uh, really amazing. I mean, look at Revelation 13. Who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? It's going to be a shock and awe time. He'll deceive the, all of mankind that have rejected the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2, to believe the lie, with signs, wonders, and miracles. So this is, this is what's coming on the horizon. And it's this particular hybrid species that involves the people that I've been working with that are members of the royal family that have been selected to bring forth the final species of the Antichrist and the false prophet as the quintessential, not alien greys as they call them, or hybrid of uh, the uh, reptilian. But when Antichrist comes, Antichrist doesn't mean against, although he's against Christ. Antichristus in the Greek, anti is a preposition, means substitute for. Yeah. So the Antichrist means he comes as a substitute, a false Christ, for the real Christ. And so can you imagine uh, the Antichrist showing up on the scene looking like an alien gray or a reptilian? Are you kidding me? Nobody's going to go after him. But if he looks like quintessential man, the idealization of Ray Kurzweil or uh, Elon Musk or these new agers. Oh, wow. I mean, we can become like him? Give me the shot. Let me be. I want to become like that. I want to become like a god. So it's this species that, that, are, that are now in the wings. And when the, time, when the restrainer is removed, Antichrist will be revealed. The false prophet will be revealed. And it's going to be shock and awe, ooh and awe. The mankind are going to say, we want to be like him. Yeah. All right. Um, so like I said, we're, I'm going to shift gears here and kind of get to some more uh, lighthearted questions. Um, what are some of your favorite movies or TV shows? Man, I just don't watch. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't really watch any TV. Let's see. Uh, what do I watch? I like to watch uh, uh, documentaries like I just watched the Evan Roberts and Great Welsh Revival and uh, the revival in Korea. I like to watch uh, historical biographies of people that really change history. I just watched a biography of uh, George Mueller. Uh, uh, the, uh, I think it's called Cloud of Witnesses. So if I watch something on TV, I like to watch um, that which is historical, 
biographical that really is reality based. Yeah. Because uh, as I think about movies, I think I watched one here the other day. I forgot what it was where all these meteors came down from Earth that's supposed to wipe out Earth. And uh, all that was kind of, I like to watch the CGI, you know, yeah. uh, computer generated imagery just to see what they do. But I don't really watch very movies. Uh, I can't think of anything on TV that I watch. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of kind of at a loss to know how to answer that. I, I don't have a lot of time for that, to be honest yeah. with you. I got you. No, no, that's good. Um, music, you have a uh, music that you listen to. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I like I like Bach. I like uh, some of the classical. I like some of the uh, uh, the great uh, like uh, what's his name uh, Virgil Fox and the uh, the very, the pipe organ. He played these massive pipe organs and played this thunderous uh, music of Bach. You know, who wrote all of his odes to the glory of Jesus Christ. I like to sit back and say, what was going on in his mind when he composed this. So I think classical music is uh, when I have time is where it really is uh, can be inspirational. Um, and then if there's some good Christian music, uh, some of it I, I think it's kind of raucous. But if it has a good theme and a good message, I like to listen to. You know, uh, you know. I think uh, he is. You know, what's his name? Andrew Peterson. That just came out a while ago. I thought that was absolutely tremendous. But there, there are the those out there that are Christian artists that you can tell that are not there to be performers. They really want to be there to lead people in the worship, like Dennis Jernigan. Um, you know, he he wasn't there to entertain, but to lead people into the presence of God. And um, I forget his mentor, Keith, somebody who was killed here. I forgot his name, but um, yeah. So anything that's uh, music, uh, music that would be inspirational, I, I enjoy that. But I, I can't think of anything more at this time. Yeah, great. Um, favorite books? I think you you actually you kind of referenced some some books earlier. Um, favorite books? Well, I've read. Uh, uh, I haven't read as much as I, I'd like to. I have. I I mainly read theological books. If you saw my library, um, I love to look in lexicons. I like to read the theological uh, references. That gives me a greater insight into the word. So most of my time is um, really digging into the word and trying to discover uh, that which I never knew before. Like I just just the other day, I, I thought, well, the very first building project that God had in the Bible, I want to see. I always always knew that in uh, you know for many years that Adam was created out of the dust of the ground. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living soul. That's Adam. Well, where did Eve come from? Well, Eve was taken out of his side, his rib. And God says, God took uh, that which was from Adam and built a woman. So the very first thing God built was a woman. So all women are built, not God's eyes. So men kind of have to deal with that and make sure it's pure. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he gave, uh, he brought Eve to the man It says, uh, um ki nagi that's there she here's a, a one who corresponds to me uh who is my helper and so uh i've got that to read now so uh i read tom some of tom horn's books i really appreciate him i'll, I'll send you the, the last interview he did with carl gallops which i'm looking forward to i just order it called the summons mm -hmm. um you'll be able to see uh, that 28 minute interview I like the things that are really cutting edge on uh, where we are in terms of history. I listen to J.D. Farag's updates every Sunday. I've been for the last year and all of his updates on all that's going on in the last year. That is, you know, all the thing on the the, the pan, uh, so-called pandemic, which is really a, a fear pandemic, which is very clear. It's a great reset. It's all laid out in the World Economic Forum. So I like to keep up to date and read on that. So, um, yeah, I'm not a novel reader. My wife is. Uh, she reads about missionary stories. And uh, so she keeps me up to date on what she's reading there. And some of the old uh, saints, like she's reading Madame Guyon right now. So she shares a lot about her spiritual journey, Fenelon, uh, some of these older saints. So we really like to stay focused on that, which is going to... Uh, 
um, bring us more into a conformity with Jesus Christ so that our, you know, re redeeming the time, not as legalism, but really uh, focusing on that, which is going to represent what we need to finish well. Because remember Solomon, when he was old in his old age, first Kings chapter 11, here's what lived all his life. And what does he do? He gets what? 300, seven, 300 wives, 700 concubines, starts worshiping other gods. Yeah. At the end of his life, I mean, I, I want to end well, so I want to make sure I stay focused on that, which is going to best facilitate me ending well. Yeah, that's great. Um, you have a favorite Bible character besides Jesus? I, I would have to say the Apostle Paul, because he wrote half the New Testament for a lot of reasons. If, if people yeah. want to know about the heart of an apostle, just read through Second Corinthians and look what he went through to be a faithful servant of the new covenant. He really paid a price. He did. A lot of opposition. A lot of opposition. Um, I, I think Job, just what he represents is tremendous. What he represents in silencing the devil and going through what he did under the hand of God and, uh, yeah. and that. And uh, you look at Moses, uh, all that he went through to be identified by that generation, the prophets. I mean, they're all tremendous people. And, uh, uh, you know, Peter to see how he ended. And John, the, you know, to see his whole spiritual reflection of Jesus Christ in, in his in the gospel and the epistles. So, but I think the single most person in terms of that, which is the, the person that, uh, I'm really looking forward to spending a couple of millennia with is would be the Apostle Paul next to Jesus. Yeah, that's great. Do uh, you have a favorite book of the Bible? Uh, it's really hard. It, it just when, when it comes to the revelation uh, that Jesus Christ gave after his resurrection, uh, he said in John 16, I have many more things to say to you, but you're not yet able to, to hear that. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will bear witness to me and he will take the things from mine. He will reveal them to you and he'll show you things to come. So I see that the culmination of that revelation that defines who we are in the church age is found in the prison epistles. So I would say the trilogy of Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians together and what that means together uh, would be. I couldn't pick out one. I would say at least those three would be the quintessential revelation of the heart of God and the mind of God for the church. And of course, to see how all prophecies converge and um, come to fruition in the book of Revelation. So it's kind of hard to pick one, but I would say uh, the prison epistles would be probably the quintessential revelation of uh, the heart and mind of Jesus Christ for the age of the church age okay so this might be a harder question um uh you have a favorite verse or, or one that's spoken to you uh, as of lately well you can have a favorite verse depending on where you are in any given situation but uh, yeah. let's see um no i mean what can i say uh favorite verse i, I don't know that i could do that i you know I, I like the thought of uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, I, of course, I use all the time when I'm appropriate all the time when I'm in counseling. Uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty four: Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. And then 1 Corinthians one thirty, you know, the Greek says, out from the source of God, that is God the Father, out from the source, preposition ek, God has made him, Jesus, the person, to become to us wisdom. In the form of righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So you put that together with, I think it was a Colossians 2 6, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so continue to walk in Him, receiving. So for me, the Christian life is an ongoing receiving a person to be and become all that God has designed for us to be. So any verse. And I can go to the Gospel of John. Jesus said, abide in me and I and you, and you shall bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So 
it's all the word together. So depending on the circumstances uh, that, that, uh, that would help me appropriate the Lord Jesus Christ as the wisdom of God and the power of God in any given situation, any verse that would help me in that, well, how about Galatians 2.20? I have been crucified with Christ. Really? Paul, you've been crucified with Christ. That's what he said. What, 16 years into his Christian experience? He wasn't always that way at the beginning. You know, we find that he shows up on the scene. Galatians is one of the first books he ever wrote along, along with Thessalonians. And he says, I've been crucified with Christ. So something happened between about 36 AD and about 52 AD where he became a crucified man. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, perfect tense. It's a, it's a done deal. I'm now in a state of being a crucified man. And it's no longer I, Saul of Tarsus, who lives. Nevertheless, I live. What do you mean you live? Well, I, I'm a member of the new creation. Now. I'm no longer Saul, I'm Paul. And nevertheless, I live. And that quality of life I'm now living in the flesh, my mortal flesh, I live by faith in and of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when he says, by live by the faith in the Son of God, by the way, the Greek is, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So of is a genitive case in the Greek, okay? So the grammarians have tried to understand, what is Paul talking about? Is this an objective genitive? Jesus is the object of my faith? Or is it subjective genitive? I live because of his faithfulness. He imparts his faith to me. And they go back and forth. Which one is it? Is it subjective or objective? Then you have some grammarians that come along and say, it's a Pauline genitive. Or some say, well, it's a mystic genitive. And then the latest grammarian, uh, Wallace, he comes up with a new way to describe that ge Pauline genitive. He calls it a plenary genitive. What's plenary? That comes from plenase, full. It's dynamic. Right. I live by the faith that comes from Jesus because he's the author and finisher of my faith, Hebrews 12, 2. And therefore, the reflex, he becomes the object of my faith. So it's yeah. dynamic genitive. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So right now, that happens to be on my favorite verse. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, what do you like to do in your free time? For fun. Well, before COVID, uh, go to the Northwest and uh, rent, a, rent an RV and and uh, travel through the Rockies and just uh, just spend time in the Northwest uh, with my wife, uh, like uh, uh, these wonderful campgrounds and an RV. That's what we used to do. Uh, renting a place on the uh, on the coast and just enjoying the uh, the outdoors. And of course, now I don't know there will never be a return to normal on that, but. Uh, yeah, and just um, you know, being with people who love the Lord, uh, who who the Lord is first place in their life. They want to, at least they want to be first place, and uh, be spending time with them. And so, yeah, uh, I really love vacations with my wife. But they, right now we're we're pretty much limited. So I think we're just going to have to uh, uh, take what we have and know that our days days are almost up here on a planet Earth, and the Lord's getting ready to translate this fairly soon i believe awesome um if you could have dinner with five people dead or alive uh who would you choose wow gosh oh let me see well yeah, maybe first thought i'd like to sit down with the table with jd farag um amir safati and pastor jack hibbs and uh, take, I'll take uh, Brandon Holt, um, Holt House, these four guys, and uh, just have an eschatological chat. Yeah. Talk with them. And, uh, and I'm sure there'd be some others I could think of. I can't think, but that just comes off the top of my head. And uh, my friend uh, I've known over 50 years, Larry Jones, uh, have him set in. And we just have a chat and see what the Lord would, uh, what he would uh, bring forth in that. Have some vigorous eschatological discussions. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I feel like I could uh, talk to you for another two hours, but um, I want to honor honor our, our, our agreed time. And, and that's that's the last question that I uh, that I had. Um, I was able to, you know, I think uh, ask all the questions that I had planned. Uh, so I want to thank you um, for for taking this time to do this interview. 
um, really enjoyed it, uh, hearing your story and allowing me to pick your brain a little bit. Well, thank you, Sam. And uh, I trust you and your wife there in Chattanooga. You, uh, it looks like you're in a, a kind of an idealized uh, sweet spot in America in view of all these different states that have these various restrictions. Uh, I kind of wished I was there in Chattanooga and I could relocate from the natural perspective. And yeah. I live here in New York where our, our, our governor is Cuomo and uh, he kind of has a fetish of wanting to be in a lot of control of our freedoms here. So I, yeah. I'm glad that you live where you are there. And, and I appreciate the, the interview and uh, I trust that the, however the Lord wants to use it, that you know, he would bless his people through this time. Got to say, it's incredible uh, to get this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, like I said, you were many years ago when I was just kind of first introduced to, um, you know, Genesis 6. Uh, there was a lot of confusion for me, and I, I went back and forth um, because uh, that Sethite view, um, uh, I don't know, I just wanted to get down to the truth, and, you know, if you, if you, look at some of the teachers that set that view uh they you know they will it's polarized they'll they'll ridicule anyone that, that believes uh yeah. in the supernatural view uh and so you were definitely one of those um like i said once i kind of heard I, I i probably would like looked up nephilim in, in, a, in a podcast search and you know i probably listen to any any interview I, I could of yours so and you taking the time that to speak with me um all those years ago uh, was something I really appreciated. So to be able to kind of now years later, um, having already looked into the subject quite a bit to, to sit down and talk to you more about it is, is uh, such a blessing. Um, and again, I do that on my own platforms uh, is incredible. So uh, praise God for that. Um, so if I just say that uh, the first three centuries of the church, they all believed in what even Josephus stated that these are fallen angels. Yeah. Josephus, uh, all the early church fathers, even Peter referred to it in 2 Peter 2, 4, the angels of sin were cast into Tartarus. So that's not the fall of Satan. Satan's not in prison right now. In Jude 6, the same thing. There, were, These angels of sin were left their estate. They went in and they were thrown into prison. That's the angels of Genesis 6. That's not Satan. He's still roaring, roaring, roaming about as a roaring lion. Yeah. So people have got their theology mixed up, but um, you look at the first three centuries of the church, all the early church fathers believed in the, the supernatural view. It wasn't until Julius Africanus, in order to fight what he saw as a central view of the millennium, that also believed in the angel, the supernatural view, he began to speak against it. And the one who really popularized <clears throat> the, uh, the Seth I view was Augustine. Or Augustine. Uh, he was the one that, because he was very very astute and he was a very uh, powerful thinker. And so he captured the mindset of that interpretation and prom promulgated that all throughout history. But it's, it's not the original view. The original view is, okay. is of course, angels, uh, the sin and, and the exegesis of Genesis six is absolutely clinching. The Beniha Elohim are, are never referred to as men. They're direct creations of God. And to be on Beniha Elohim, they took to themselves the daughters of Adam and they produced this hybrid offspring. So the exegesis is very clear, but it requires a supernatural view. The other thing I was going to comment on what you said, uh, is it, I think Russ is the one that said this. I don't know if it's the, maybe it's a conversation. I don't know, but he may have said it on a program. But he said in the last 20 years, and that's probably been, what, five years ago, he said there have been more books written on Nephilim than all previous uh, uh, times in church history. So yeah. something's going on. There's a, it's like God is stirring people up to, and if all this is being written on the Nephilim, um, then obviously we're in that time of history when Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be at the return of the Son of Man. We're there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and Michael uh, Heiser is another great resource. Um, but you know, if, you know, when listen to to your work, um, it, it, you know that that very much uh, seems clear. You know, you're one of those that, you know, you you experienced it, you've seen it, and so, um, yeah, that was uh, 
eye-opening for me. Yeah. Well, Michael Eisner's done a great work on the unseen realm. I read the book and uh, Reversing Herman. Uh, there's some theolo theology in there that I would uh, not accept, but he's done a great seminal work. I've, uh, I've talked, I've visited with Michael. To him, this idea that there are current hybrids today, to him, he would want the DNA proof. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Michael, where am I going to go get the DNA proof? Am I going to go into an underground base? Uh, the question is, let every established be, uh, every fact be established on the base of two or three witnesses. I've worked with people all over the world that don't even know each other. They're reporting the same thing. Yeah. So for me, I have the facts because these witnesses, they're no longer, many of them are no longer dissociated. They have their history. They're integrated and they know what they know. So to me, that is factual. The hybrid, the, the hybrids are here. And so even our brother would want to have DNA proof. That's kind of the way he thinks. And I'm glad that he's a very critical thinker because uh, he's done a lot of current contribution. And uh, so Mike, I like the way he presents because he's very relaxed and, and um, uh, very congenial. And so he's a good brother, but I do have some differences on, on this whole way in which he perceives the current hybrid breeding program. I, we do have those differences, but I love the brother because he's truly a brother. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, all right, well, any um, parting words? Uh, before I let you go? No, I just pray that uh, that which would uh, serve the Lord in whatever assignments he has for you, that the prayer of our Lord Jesus in John 17 would be hastened and realized, and all the prayers of the Apostle Paul and Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians would be realized in this generation. The Lord would just bring you in the fullness of his anointing uh, so that you would um, come into the good of those prayers that Jesus prayed in John 17 and uh, the prayers of the Apostle Paul, that you would be an instrument that God would use to see this age consummated because I believe we're living in the final generation in Jesus' name. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. Um, okay. All right, Sam. It's great talking to you. All right, Sam. Blessings to you. All, All right. right. Bye. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hope this was as encouraging for you as it was for me. Personally, I left feeling challenged. It's incredible to see Doug's dedication to the Lord and willingness to go where so many others are not. If you enjoyed this video, share it with a friend. If you're listening on YouTube, like and subscribe. If you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, leave us a rating and review. You can send me an email at the weird Christian Podcast at gmail.com. And more episodes coming soon, so we'll catch you on the next one.